Good the director of TC is not a liar. <laughs> I, I didn't study law. I studied demography. And, um, uh, but prisons have always fascinated me uh, because of the <coughs> American films. <laughs> so uh, I, I, that fascination um, was, was very interesting. And so when I was in the US, I visited uh, prisons in the United States. When I worked in Cape Town, I went to prisons in uh, South Africa. When I came down to Bangkok, um, I visited prisons in Bangkok. I must tell you that each one of them had a different socio-political economic context. The American prisons were privatized. You know, the more people they had, the more money they get. So there was an incentive to keep them out there. The, the South African system is that higher the greater the poverty, greater the number of people in the uh, prison system. And Thailand, you know, it was like a factory. The more prisoners you had, you know, the Nike and um, you know uh, the garment factories made profit out of it because these were captive laborers. You know, they could make money off it. And um, but more mostly, um, whether it is the Thailand, whether it is the, of course, South Africa was a was a was a disturbed country. I think the progress is towards copying the American model. That, increasingly privatized. So there is, a, there is a positive correlation between the level of poverty and marginalized group people and the prison population. Okay. So you need to deal with poverty if you were to deal with um, a, a prison actually. You know, I just, uh, you know, uh, I just clicked through uh, the BBC and uh, it was running a very interesting documentary on um, the wealth of nations, not Adam Smith's, but it's the new wealth of nations. Why is it that one percentage of the population owns 99% of the world's wealth? And why um, governments are increasingly trying to um, make money out of the bottom of the pyramid? So you are going to find more and more of these uh, 400 people ending up in um, jails because um, you know, then you don't need to give them job. They become captive labor actually, and um, and they are the people who would not have access to justice actually. So when I came to TIS, you know, I, I was in TIS. I lived for ten years and wandered all those places and came back in TIS. Social work alone may not be a sufficient. You needed to have a legal angle to it, and that's when um, you know. As soon as the opportunity arose, we start that that uh, you know master of law in access to justice, and that I think the third batch will be coming out this year. Um, what <coughs> Madhuri Ma said was a note which I wrote uh, along with the Professor Asa Bajpai some three four years ago, and we had a consultation at National Law School, Bangalore, saying that. Can the law schools across the country come together, create a framework whereby, you know, make it mandatory for the fourth and fifth year students to um, to document um, whether it is the under trials or you know those who have been um, who have been tried, um, create documentation and fight the cases. Of course, um, you know. Since I'm not a lawyer, I'm not a law professor, I'm not a vice chancellor of a law university, you know, it moves very slowly. So I was, I'm after now, um, Professor Panda, get the vice chancellors um, convinced that we need to get a network of universities, law universities, that made, um, you know, legal aid as a mandatory uh, condition. And you know, in the sense that let them go every week, one day, to, um, to, a, to a community or to a prison or to a, a, you know, a, a detention home whereby these young people can actually do some work. Because anyway they are going to sell the capital, they are not going to sell the poor. But at least when they are studying, by putting them through to that process, you can make them to do little, uh, some better work. This is one part of it. The second is that along with a Keel University's law school, we have created a website. This is an interactive website. 
it allows for um, anyone you know in distress to register now once it is registered then you need to have a battery of people who can who can follow up that and build that build that case and then link it up to a lawyer who can who can take it up actually the the the, the, the website is um, fully developed it is being translated into um, local language and we want to um, roll it out um, in UK government has fully opted out of legal service like you know the Anglo-Saxon model is very different actually. So they they have totally gotten out of um, out of legal service to uh, uh, poor people, and um, and so universities have taken up this responsibility. And Keel has done a good work on, on on this part of it. So what we did is that we brought the uh, programmer from Keel, and 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 we we have gotten that um, worked out here, and we want to uh, make it go online. But then we need people to service that you know otherwise people would be unnecessarily uh, getting ambitious and they're saying that somebody is going to help them so friends what i am trying to tell you is that don't leave it to only a handful of um, you know good-natured liars and and civil society organizations to fight for the justice of overwhelming number of our people because that is not possible And you are reaching a situation whereby you not even question why a person is arrested. It become a national security thing actually. Okay. So you need you can't question why a person is arrested. You can't really do much work on legal uh, assistance. You know, in, in some places like you know, like in, in Chhattisgarh they were evicted. Um, so you can you can have a problem with this. But we need to create a framework whereby we are able to reach out. We are able to reach out, but that's a big job actually. If this if this group can um, come back after six months and try and develop a framework, in the meantime, of course, we can do research on um, you know that uh, video conferencing. I think I can't have video conferencing between uh, two universities. I don't know how uh, you can, between a prison and um, a law court, you can have video conferencing because, but I hope uh, we can do, but the government through, you know, the, the, the secretary sitting in his office is able to video conference with all the collectors. If they can do that, certainly it is possible, but, you know, to preserve what is there is no good, but to make that as a standard operating procedure as to how a procedure data be followed, that this should be done. So I think let us do some more research on that. Let's do some research on varying models that has been in place. And our universities, both law universities and other universities need to do something for people in terms of providing some support. And poor people needed to be, you know, poorer communities, they are sitting at home, wife or husband, they are leaving someone in prison. They don't have any idea what to do actually with, with the situation. You know, they do not know where, which prison they are, um, they are, they are lodged in. So the, the, the website process, what we have identified is that uh, it will be a good way to link up with people, but you also need paralegal workers. You need paralegal workers who to work with the communities in order to link up with the system. Otherwise, how would they have the knowledge of reaching out to a support system that is available? Um, this again, law schools can pro uh, play a very important role in creating, um, creating this framework. So my own ambition is that every university in this country, whether it is law university or medical university or this university or that university, should have a legal a clinic. The law schools need to play a much important role. We need to encourage, you know, increasing number of young people to get into uh, working with people rather than working for the capital. I think there are, there are a number of things that can be done, but that can be done only collectively. Um, so it's a risk list. Thank you. <laughs>